in the vast area of the Middle East, the Holy Land is only one small sliver. The population of Palestinians and Israelis number fewer than 10 million out of a Middle Eastern population of more than 200 million. And yet, the unresolved quarrel between the Palestinians and the Israelis, the seemingly endless bloody struggle over control of the land, this has created a situation that disturbs not only the peace of the region, but threatens the peace of the whole world. The Holy Land, so it has been called by millions of devout believers over many centuries. A land sacred to Jews, Christians, and Muslims, often also the scene of unspeakable violence. After the collapse of the Camp David talks in the summer of 2000 and the outbreak of the Second Intifada, the two sides resorted to the most horrible violence against one another. Each with stubborn self-righteousness blamed the other of indiscriminately killing hundreds of innocent civilians, many women and children. On that harsh judgment of each other, both were correct. For four years after 2000, Israel was traumatized by suicide bombings, buses, restaurants, crowded shopping streets, Around a 1,000 Israelis killed, including many children. Israeli retaliation has always been swift and overpowering. In the same period, almost 4,000 Palestinians and their children lost their lives through Israeli military action. I've watched the tragedy of the conflict from the inside, the pain and suffering and the endless negotiations which never seem to lead to a permanent end to the killing. For four years as rector of the Tom Turek Medical Institute between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, I helped bring together Christian, Jewish, and Muslim scholars and religious leaders for study and dialogue, and sometimes high-level unpublicized exchanges on crucial issues. The basic quarrel, of course, is over the land. Under the Armistice Agreement of 1949, Israel held roughly three quarters of historic Palestine. The Arabs held an area west of the River Jordan, plus the Gaza Strip. The boundary became known as the Green Line. Even Jerusalem was split in two. 18 years later, after the War of 1967, Israel established military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Although they left the Gaza Strip in 2005, the whole of the West Bank remains under Israeli military occupation. This fact incites increasing, continuing anger and resentment among the Palestinians. The whole system is based on occupying force, subjugating uh, Palestinian people. If you look at the military laws, if you look at the behavior of the soldiers, if you look at the bureaucratic approach of the system here. On the other hand, Israelis insist that there is now no alternative to a military occupation. Although we try and deny it, the reason that these people have to be there is because if they weren't there, our um, our families and our children and ourselves would be vulnerable targets and would, as, as we've seen only too many times, be blown to pieces. A major issue is the separation barrier built by the Israelis. It's going to be 400 miles long. The purpose is to separate the Palestinians on the West Bank from the Israelis. It's where we can most effectively stop the terrorists getting to the Jews and the Israelis that are targets for them, wherever they are, on either side of the Green Line. It is constructed in the middle of uh, the neighborhood. 
You can see on, on the right side, uh, Palestinian neighborhoods, and on the left side, it's Palestinian neighborhoods. So the wall is constructed between Palestinian. 32,000 Palestinian will be on the other side of the wall. And here on this side, about 230,000 Palestinian will be cut off from their relatives, from their families, from uh, the market on the other side. I went to visit Colonel Benzi Gruber, an Israeli army reservist, commander of a brigade of 4,000 men. What is his opinion of the wall? The Persian wall is a very bad solution, really. If you see the way that it goes, you know, in every kilometer it goes something around 10 kilometers, like this. It's, you know, not logical. You can't even think about an, an really army that, you know, can defend a, a stuff like this. And I don't think that this is the, 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 end, the solution. It has become the symbol of everything the Palestinians hate most about the Israeli occupation. For many villagers and farmers, the wall threatens their livelihood, and they try to stop it however they can. Most of the West Bank is rural, and life for village people is precarious. Alongside the wall, the checkpoints represent the worst evils of the occupation. The experience of passing through these checkpoints is, for most Palestinians, an inescapable daily humiliation. Dr. Jad Izak, a leading Palestinian environmentalist, heads a research institute in Bethlehem. When you see the Palestinians, what they are subjected to, when I have to spend one hour every time on the checkpoint uh, going outside Bethlehem and then another one hour getting into Ramallah, and a similar treatment going back and for no reason to be uh, humiliated by the Israeli soldiers uh, as a result of uh, me trying to get from Bethlehem to Ramallah. I go back home at the end of the day so full of anger and so full of uh, bitter feelings that, you know, uh, I have to utilize a lot of efforts to quench this little demon in me who wants to go and revenge. Every day, our security officials are asking themselves, well, maybe today we can allow in people who are over the age of 30, or people who are married and have children, because they're less of a security risk. And then we'll have an incident like we had two weeks ago with a woman who was smuggling in explosives under her baby. East Jerusalem is home to more than 200,000 Palestinians, some of whose families have lived there for hundreds of years. Their long-term status, however, is seriously in doubt. One of the difficulties which Palestinians are facing is the house demolition policy by the Israeli Jerusalem municipality. Last year, for example, more than 150 houses was demolished by the municipality under the pretext that it is built without permit. And this is an example of house demolition. You can see it on the... And in this way, less and less Palestinian population are in East Jerusalem. Ever since their extraordinary victory in the Six-Day War of 1967, the Israelis have been building Israeli Jewish settlements scattered throughout the occupied Palestinian Arab territories. Towns, small outposts, some becoming real cities. For many of the settlers, the very act of living on this land is an assertion of a God-given right. Kiryat Arba, is close to the biblical town of Hebron, the home of Abraham. Gary Cooperberg was one of the original settlers. If you look in the Bible, it's, it's very clearly written 
that God promised this land to Abraham as a, an eternal inheritance for him and his children. This vacant hillside became the first major uh, community to be built in the lands that we redeemed in 1967. In new neighborhoods around Jerusalem and across the West Bank now live Israeli Jews on lands taken over from the Palestinians. How, asked the Palestinians, can you ever create a viable state with permanent Jewish settlements scattered throughout the proposed new Palestine? Many Palestinians have emigrated over the past 50 years to various foreign countries. Moreover, several hundred thousands of refugees still live in camps in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon, here in the West Bank, as well as in Gaza. They have no land of their own and no right of return to their original villages and towns. The El Arub camp is on the road between Bethlehem and Hebron. It was established after the 48-49 war and many Palestinians, now middle-aged, were born here and have known no other home. People is very poor in, um, in our camp here. Yeah, and um, we have many social problems that happen between the couple at home. Yeah. Because he did not Poverty, unemployment, and above all, resentment at the occupation has encouraged violence. All over the West Bank and Gaza, young Palestinians took to the streets in anger and frustration. The Israeli army was not slow to retaliate. Oppressive measures which we are subjected to every day are driving Palestinians into extremism and fundamentalism. A number of extremist organizations such as Islamic Jihad and the Al-Aqsa Brigade are well armed. They appeal to young men already seething with anger who embrace the message that nothing can change Israeli policies except armed resistance. The world was shocked to discover how great is the voter appeal of Hamas. I went to Gaza to meet the Hamas leader, Dr. Mahmoud al-Zahar. In 2003, he survived an assassination attempt by the Israelis that took the life of his son. What anybody will expect from, from, uh, from people like us if their house is demolished, if their son killed, if their trees are removed, if they, they change Gaza into a big prison. We started by peaceful method, and when the international community neglected our national demand, and when the Israeli treated our national demand very aggressively, we resorted to uh, run a self-defense by using gun. The ultimate and most terrifying form of armed resistance is suicide bombing. Do the people who support suicide bombing believe that this will win them popular support? The question, the question is not popularity. The question how to, 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 to convince the other side that their occupation is costing them too much. The aim is to push the Israel outside. Now when we succeeded to push them outside Gaza Strip, we stopped that. So it's not our intention to kill a, a, a civilian. I have known Hanan Ashrawi for many years. She was long the most respected public voice of the PLO. I put it to her that the Israelis will not talk while the violence continues. So far they have succeeded in holding the peace process hostage to this mentality on the one hand. And on the other, they have provoked tremendous violence by acts of incitement, like shelling, bombing, uh, um, house demolitions, uh, uprooting trees, destroying crops, assassinating political leaders, placing all the Palestinians in, under closure in a state of, of total immobility, a prison. And yet, and then they wonder why are some Palestinians reacting violently. And so they want to have the right to exercise violence against the captive population and the right to make nonviolence on the part of the Palestinians, a precondition for the Palestinians to qualify for talks, let alone for statehood. 
Many Israelis put themselves on the line to help build trust between both sides. Rabbi Eric Asherman heads an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. On this particular day, we were at a demonstration. I get a call and I'm told to come over to this neighborhood in the village because a young boy has been caught by the border police. He's being beaten. So I and three other Israelis make our way to where this is happening. Uh, I see this young boy strapped to the windshield of one of the jeeps, shivering in fear, unsuccessfully trying to keep back the tears. Who knows what he thinks about all Israelis, perhaps all Jews. But when he gave an affidavit to our fellow human rights organization, B'Tselem, after describing all the terrible things that happened to him, he concluded by saying, and then a tall Jewish man in a kippah came to my rescue and told me not to be afraid. What I do involves risk. Like that day, I've been many times beaten up by Israeli soldiers and security forces. I've been attacked by settlers. And I've had my car stoned by Palestinians. But I will go through all that again and again and again. For the young boy who will say, and then a tall Jewish man in a kippah came to my rescue and told me not to be afraid. Jonathan Katab is an old friend, a Palestinian lawyer who devotes much of his time to human rights issues. Everybody knows what it would take uh, to achieve a permanent and lasting peace here. That both sides would accept. That, that addresses the basic interests of both sides. And it's a two-state solution. It's withdrawal to the 67 borders. It's dismantlement of the settlements. It's some kind of shared uh, status uh, for, a uni for a united uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the capital of both. Capital for both uh, parties. The West Bank, Gaza, will have to be demilitarized to, to remove any security threat for Israel. Uh, some uh, solution has to be reached for the refugee problem, some qualified return, some compensation, some refugee. settlement for the Palestinian refugees. Uh, I, I think everybody knows what it takes. The question is, is there the political will to implement it? I don't think any difference now between the majority of Israelis and Palestinians in understanding that we have to find some accommodation for both people. And from that point of view, I think there's been immense progress over the last 10, 20 years. And there are two possibilities of how to do it. One is to acknowledge and then to implement the Palestinian right to self-determination and to make sure that that solution, the two-state solution, is a just and fair solution which allows for the creation of a viable Palestinian state alongside Israel on the 1967 boundaries. And if there are any changes, they're by agreement on a, on a swap basis. And on the Israeli side, there is the need to maintain a democratic state with a Jewish majority, which can only be achieved through the creation of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Deeply embedded into the whole conflict, of course, are issues and symbols of religion. None is more emotionally powerful than the issue of Jerusalem. In addition to being the central holy shrine for Jews and for Christians, Jerusalem is also sacred to Muslims. In the holy month of Ramadan, an endless stream of worshipers winds its way through the old city on the way to pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is the third most holy Islamic shrine in the world. For the Jews, this is the Temple Mount, the site of King Solomon's Temple, which some ultra-Orthodox Jews now want to restore at the expense of the mosque. Its western wall is sacred beyond measure, the closest spot to the Holy of Holies in the ancient temple. Any settlement would have to work out how both sides would share the city. We have Jerusalem, which is a very difficult issue. 
because of the symbolism of Jerusalem, but we've seen the negotiations and the talks between Israelis and Palestinians, both at the formal level of the negotiations, track one, and all kinds of track two. We come to more or less the Clinton parameters of what's Arab to the Palestinians, what's Jewish to the Israelis. The Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif, will be under some kind of Islamic embodiment with Palestinian control of it. The Western Wall, the Kotel under Israel, um, this is workable, it's doable, and I think that if there's a belief on both sides that peace is possible, it will also be accepted. The question of the settlements and their future is perhaps the single most critical issue that has to be solved if peace is ever to come. Despite the convictions of a deeply committed ideological minority, more and more settlers are now so fed up the tensions and the conflict that they are prepared to move out of the settlements if a clear path to peace can be found. Colonel Gruber lives in Efrat, a large settlement near Jerusalem to which he came 21 years ago. I will tell you what I think. I think that, I, I, and I told it a lot, that I, I agree to give my property, I agree to give my house back if I believe that it will be peace. If, if there would be peace. So, if, if, I, if, if I agree to risk my, my life in the, you know, in the army, yeah. if I agree that my children will serve in the army, right. so not to give the property for, for peace, I will give it. The question if you believe that it will be peace. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't believe that soul is holy, I don't believe that rocks is holy, and I don't believe the house is holy. My soul is holy. The soul of my children is holy. Not the house. So for me, if I will understand that, okay, that's the way that we have to give, I, I will give it back. With no any hesitate, we have to find a solution. And I believe that most of the population in Israel, most I mean, more than 70%, understand that we have to, to compromise. Remarkably, in 2005, in a dramatic and controversial shift in policy, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon decided to pull out 8,000 Israeli settlers and the entire occupying force from the Gaza Strip. Fiercely resisted by many settlers, but supported by most Israelis, the withdrawal was finally achieved without bloodshed. Well, uh, seven years ago, on the 4th of September 1997, we lost our daughter to a Palestinian suicide bombers who blew themselves up in Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem. in Jerusalem. And this has changed our lives totally. And from this enormous pain, from this tragedy, we decided to do something with it in order to try and prevent more bereavedness, more pain. So we are engaged in, a, in an organization which is called the Bereaved Families Forum for Peace, an Israeli-Palestinian joint organization, which tries to create hope out of this endless pain. What kinds of things specifically do you do? What uh, activities do you carry out? Oh, so many things. The most important thing that we do is uh, lectures at high school. Last year we gave more than uh, 1,000 lectures. In at, Israel? In Israel and in Palestine. And in Palestine. Yeah, we, we step into an Israeli or a Palestinian class, usually together with the Palestinian partner and uh, talk about hope, talk about reconciliation, talk about dialogue. The fact that we are bereaved opens the door, opens the heart, because in the Israeli society and in the Palestinian society, bereaved families are respected tremendously. And this is it, this is the basic of it, looking forward and trying to, to solve this matter. And the only way to solve it is by listening. To the other. Yeah, by understanding. You don't have to accept no. everything, but you have to listen. You have to try and understand. And the basic problem, the essence of everything, is the total blindness of the two sides to the narrative and the pain of the other. 
And the greatest danger to the future of Israel, the Jewish democratic state in the future, is the continuation of the occupation. And the occupation goes on with the American support. And the minute the Americans will understand it, which the Europeans seem to be understanding it for the last years, then what is necessary will be done. And what is necessary is that the Americans will initiate a peace process which will be just. I'm talking as the son of a Holocaust survivor. My father is an Auschwitz graduate. And 60 years ago, well, they took my grandparents to the ovens in Europe, the free and civilized world stood aside and never lifted a finger. And today, while these two crazy people are massacring each other, the free and civilized world is still standing aside and almost doing nothing, not only that, by supporting one side almost unconditionally. And what I am begging from people when I end any lecture of mine is not to stand aside, is to show some, some feeling, some understanding, some, some and try to solve this horrible conflict before it will finish us all. The most insistent challenge to all of us is not to stand aside. Since the United States is the only country that clearly has decisive influence with both sides, we have the obligation to provide imaginative diplomacy backed by our wealth and power. The President, the Secretary of State, and the Congress should hear from the American people that we support full, unflagging, determined work to make a negotiated peace happen. <laughs>